Off top at about 6,700 degrees Fahrenheit, diamonds turn to vapor. Play the music. This is the Dominique Foxworth Show. Welcome to the Dominique Foxworth Show. We are joined by our traditional Sunday Sunday guest who looks very concerned, like he doesn't believe my scientific knowledge, the great and powerful Bill Barnwell. What's up, buddy? That's why they call me the traditional Sunday roast, Bill <laughs> Barnwell. Oh, man, it's good to see you on a Sunday. We don't have football uh, games to talk about, but we got football business to talk about because uh, good for Baker. <laughs> <laughs> Right, everybody. Oh, anyway, before before we get too deep into this topic, later on in the show, we got David Dennis Jr. on. Charlie is going to um, reveal some very embarrassing things about himself. David Dennis and I are going to talk about basketball. A little love is blind. Stick around for that. But first, good for Baker, guys. Good for Baker. This this news <laughs> broke a couple minutes ago while we were taping. Baker Mayfield returning to the Bucks. Three years, $100 million, 115 with incentives, $50 million guaranteed. They're also bringing back Mike Evans. Um, Bill Barnwell, your thoughts. Buy or sell the contract. <laughs> I like this. I like a buy or sell. I love, love a good buy or sell. I want to react. I got a lot of training on the buy or sell hey, streets these days. Hey, hey I'm, I'm, you're muted. No, no, go ahead. <laughs> oh, no. I, I'm going to sell the Baker Mayfield contract because we know what happens with Baker Mayfield, right? Like, there's a very simple corollary. If nobody believes in Baker, then <laughs> Baker balls out. The moment anybody believes in Baker, he is a disaster mess, and you can't get him off your team as quickly as possible. That's the only rule of oh Baker gosh. you need to know. So I think the Bucks were smart to go out and get him last year for a one-year $4 million deal and played well enough to win the division. I don't think watching him play, I felt like, oh, my God, he has to come back here for – $50 million guaranteed over the next two years, just the early reports and what he's making. I don't know what other teams were going to be in the market to pay him that much. Maybe he was going to be the plan B for whoever doesn't get Kirk Cousins, but I think there is a thing happening in the NFL right now where because the Daniel Jones contract is so bad, it's like, well, at least we didn't pay Daniel Jones $40 million a year. I guess by that standard, it's good, but I just don't think Baker Mayfield's going to be uh, a guy who's going to age well in, in Tampa. Well, Baker's contract, it's funny that you say that it seems like they believe in him because I would say that the Daniel Jones contract and the Baker contract are similar in that it's clear that they don't fully believe in him. They may have uh, they may have allocated more money in the short term to these guys, but these are not. this is not $50 million guaranteed for a quarterback. Like, that's not... Uh, we believe in you type of money. That's not what we see for quarterbacks that are top of the league. So um, obviously he's not top of the league, but quarterbacks that teams believe in uh, fully. And the Daniel Jones contract was structured in such a way that they could get out after two years. And Baker's is only for three years. So it's not right. Like I, I, I guess I'm lost in, in taking this as some big vote of confidence. He was a good quarterback for them that they, mm -hmm. They didn't want to move on to the no man's land of no quarterback. It doesn't seem like this is an incredibly restrictive contract. I think the interesting thing is he was almost out of the league. I mean, like legitimately. Yes, yes he was literally the worst quarterback in football in 2022. When, when you say this no man's land of not being able to find a quarterback, that's exactly where they were last year. And they still found a guy who was good for $4 million and got to use the rest of that money to improve the rest of their roster and won the division. Like, I, to me, I, I don't know... We're going to see what happens, but would they be worse off with Gardner Minshew making $10 million a year on a one-year deal? I don't, I don't think so. And you're right. It's only a two-year commitment, but that's still, for them, $60 million they're going to have to pay Baker Mayfield. For the Giants, it's $80 million they're going to have to pay Daniel Jones. Like That organization has already realized its mistake, and they're still stuck paying Daniel Jones $40 million this upcoming year, even though... They're either going to draft a quarterback. They're they're going to be moving on from Daniel Jones. They've realized their mistake. Like it's it's already a lame duck year for them. I think that's the one thing you typically want to try to avoid with your contracts in the NFL is just don't get stuck with something like the Russell Wilson deal, like the Daniel Jones deal, where it's so far underwater that there's nothing you can do about it. 
Yeah, I mean, okay, I agree with you. I'm, I guess I'm playing devil's advocate for the point of this conversation because Baker's not someone that I would want to commit to. But honestly, I'm not even going to say I'm playing devil's advocate because that suggests that I don't believe that I believe that this is an awful decision. I don't think it's an awful decision. It's a short-term commitment to a guy who shows some promise. And you can know that I don't feel completely confident in this and the fact that I will go to the things that I know will not convince uh, Bill Barnwell <laughs> is – the idea of you have a good team or a team that overachieved with a player that yes. overachieved, rewarding that player and mm. perpetuating whatever momentum you do have while you can while you are still looking for quarterbacks. Momentum, yes, I used it. I know it's sacrilege to you. I think there's something that, there's something to be said for the social impact of keeping your quarterback who you had success with, and he has high end talent. We can't. He, it's not a guy who's like without talent. This is a, not a no-name guy that hasn't shown the ability to play well in short spurts. Well, it's also, don't you think once you sign Mike Evans, you had to bring back like Baker or a real quarterback? Because well, otherwise, what's the point of yeah, paying that yeah. money for? Sure, I, I I agree with that. But there's going to be a lot of quarterbacks who are real quarterbacks out there. There's going to be Gardner Minshew. There's going to be probably Ryan Tannehill. Um, you know, there's going to be this contract sounding a lot better as you go through. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, I don't you think get, you're making the point that you think you're making here. You get, you get, you get a lot more money to spend on other guys, and I think that's going to uh, that's going to be what makes this team go in the long run. It's not what what they have a quarterback, but the guys around the quarterback. Well, we don't know what these guys are going to sign for or where they're going to end up. These other guys, I uh, assume, are going to cost more than they are worth too, because that's what happens when they are decent quarterbacks. They may not cost as much as Baker Mayfield, but they cost more than they are worth. And Baker has proven that he can win in this system with these players. The uncertainty of bringing someone in who you think is just as good means that they may not have the same level of success. Dominique, you got to embrace the uncertainty, <laughs> wrap it around you, except that you just had this happen last year. They embraced the uncertainty and got rewarded. Embraced for it. it? They didn't go out. Were they, they, did they embraced they, it. They went out. Did they embrace it? Baker they fell into it. They fell, this is exactly what they, they fell into it, and they fell into a good quarterback who was good enough to win a awful, ugly division that we made fun of every week. Okay, and that's unlikely. Teams don't do that every year. Arguing that they're going to be able to do it in back-to-back -back years seems to go against whatever uh, probability that you, would, that you would pray to because well, numbers are your god. So I do have a question. <laughs> this, is, this is something that Bill, Bill might like also, too, because it's the concern of, you know, Russell Wilson's best seasons, Geno Smith's resurgence, Baker Mayfield's resurgence all happened with dirty dog Dave Canales coaching him up and he's gone now and do you have more concern about how he'll play without that quarterback <laughs> friendly <laughs> coach I, I listen this is the canales scheme that we knew was running things i, I mean I, I don't know i i just like i i was sitting here last year and the giants were signing daniel jones because and the thing i heard all the time was oh they got to get stability they won a playoff game he proved that he was part of the team they got to reward the guy who balled out for them and like two weeks into the following season we were like what on earth did they do to themselves and the players on the team were complaining that he got paid and saquon did get paid so whatever idea that you had to pay those guys and people would appreciate it that was out the window also dominic i've, I've never heard uh, a team say listen we suck we're furious that we suck but at least we feel good that baker got paid good for baker they put out the hashtag. Yeah. I'm sure that's going to be what we're going to see later this year I, when the Bucks start like 0 and 5. I think maybe an argument against or an argument based around moral hazard might be a better one to to make in this situation because <laughs> you would not do this while you while you may sincerely believe that it's the right thing to do. If you mm -hmm. were Todd Bowles or Light, you would not go into this uncertainty that you're saying that you would love to embrace but that's not the point because we're in the media the whole point is that we can you can do this objectively <laughs> and not have our jobs connected to the uncertainty no, 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 of no. It. i get it that's fine i'm happy that you are here to be objective but i'm also here to actually be a human and put myself in that situation and i know wow i agree with all the things that that bill is saying that if i was there i would not let baker's mediocre Leave my building. I'm not doing it. So I can go out oh. there and cross my fingers and hope another mediocre quarterback comes oh, in there and plays well. Oh, congrats on your humanity. You're so no, human. No, 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 no. It's not about being human. It's not about protecting Baker's feelings. It's about me being honest about what I would do in this actual situation. I can't believe you just bragged about being a human being. Yeah, you two robots. <laughs> pair of robots. It'd be one thing if they hadn't, they literally had not done this exact thing last year of just, ah, whatever, we'll just go with Kyle Trask and whoever's left like two weeks into free agency, who is Baker, and 
it worked out just fine for them. Yeah. I don't know. Okay, maybe cool. maybe I, I I could see your point. I, I think uh, it's fine. probably probably I would be scared as well. Uh, but this dead horses. I don't got dead. I don't got I don't gotta be scared out here, Dominique. We can be real out here. <laughs> I, 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 I I I don't I don't gotta pretend that. We got to lock in with Baker six months before the season starts. I mean, but I don't know. Maybe maybe he would have had a big market elsewhere. I can't say. I just don't see. Like, who else is paying him $50 million guaranteed, do you think? Atlanta. Do you, do you want Atlanta to pay him $50 million, though, if you're the Bucks, Are you like, we're good? Maybe? I kind of feel like they would be good. I assume that someone would pay him this money. I don't think that the Bucks just were like, hey, nobody wants him. We'll overpay him. Baker Mayfield, like the. I just, saw, I just saw the Giants get Daniel Jones get eighty two million dollars from the Giants though. I don't know I don't if want anybody else wanted to pay Daniel this Jones. Topic now it makes me mad. <laughs> this is enough. What's, what's next, Charlie? <laughs> They're just lucky. That- I'm back, baby. <laughs> you don't make me mad. This topic annoys me. <laughs> Let's move from uh, one quarterback in this situation to another. Uh, Mac Jones got traded to the Jaguars for a six round pick. Oof. There were uh, there are a lot of teams that need quarterbacks. The second draft has been successful at certain points and unearthing guys that people have given up on. Are you surprised? Because this is how it feels to me. Are you surprised that the league has more or less given up on Mac Jones? Hashtag bad for Mac. I think. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you who I am surprised by, and it's Kyle Shanahan. Because remember, all the, all the talk before that draft was that Kyle Shanahan traded up, wanted Mac Jones. Got a little scurred, and then I was like, ah, oh, we'll just take Trey Lance instead. And Mac Jones fell to the Patriots, and it kind of felt like that was this reunion that was supposed to happen and never actually happened. They're going to have an open spot behind Brock Purdy, and they weren't willing to match a sixth round pick or give a fifth round pick to go out and get Mac Jones to be their backup next year. Um, I, I think that is the telling part to me. Not that the Patriots were going to trade Mac Jones, not that there wasn't a ton of interest in Mac Jones, but there were a lot of people that year who were that your Mac Jones was good who were out here talking about how he was a great prospect how they liked him coming out of the draft and none of those people went out and were willing to give up a fifth round pick to go and get Mac Jones can you imagine the media storm if, they, if that's like I feel Thank like they you. literally like, dude, am I the only person here who's, who's going to be human again is like this is not a video game you cannot bring your the guy who you were fawning over in to be behind Brock Purdy who already like despite how well he played uh in stretches in the season and in the Super Bowl like you know what's going to happen it happened with Darnold back there when Darnold was going to start, people started getting all worked up about, oh, Sam Darnold might not give the job back. It's not about whether it's real. It's about did it become a thing? And yes, it became a thing. And there, if Mac Jones is great, then it's worth potentially creating whatever drama that that will create. He ain't. So why in the hell would the 49ers consider breaking him in? Here's why. The 2022 NFC Championship game when they had to run out Josh Johnson with a chance to make it to the Super Bowl. I get it. I get it. That's why the Jaguars. But this is, this this is, a, is this a, in, entirely contradictory to the thing that you just said to the question before. It's a bunch, of, it's a bunch of mediocre, mediocre quarterbacks out there. Why are we going to get one that's going to create some sort of nonsense uh, drama around our team? Go get any other mediocre quarterback. That's what you just said. Like you just named a bunch of mediocre quarterbacks that, that could be good anywhere. Okay, never mind. There's no drama. There won't be a thing if if uh, Mac Jones is behind uh, Brock Purdy. That won't be a thing all damn season. You know, but if if you believe, and if Kyle, that's the thing, if Kyle Shanahan believes Mac Jones is an NFL caliber starting quarterback, even if it's going to be a thing, doesn't the benefit of having a legit NFL cal- starting caliber backup quarterback outweigh? the potential drama of what might happen if Mac Jones comes in? Maybe. Maybe. At the very least, it's worth considering for a fifth round pick. I mean, it's, it, it's, it, depends on, it depends on what you believe you have in Brock Purdy, and it depends on what you, how much you believe this impacts him and his development. And maybe it doesn't at all. If you believe that there's a 10% chance that it negatively impacts his development, then I don't bring him in. And okay. if you believe there's a... A 5% chance that maybe well, you bring him in. Can I ask about a team that I think legitimately should have brought him in? And maybe for Ooh. a fifth round pick? There's this guy used to work for Kyle Shanahan. He has Miami. Yeah, that's right. Why didn't the Dolphins <laughs> trade for him? Because Tua is a legitimate injury concern every single season. 
He can't throw the ball if the if there are winds gusting more than six miles an hour. <laughs> Mac Jones could have fit in that exact system and done the same thing. I mean, you're not wrong, but is that going to create any less drama than Brock Purdy? I don't know what Mac Jones's uh, cap number is going forward. It's but... like two point six million. Okay, for one year. Yeah, that's that's not enough. He was a first round pick, and they're going to decline his fifth year option, so he's going to be a free agent after next year. Right. There's also some great drama in the fact that. He used to be to his backup in college, and then before the NFL draft, Jalen Waddell was asked which quarterback yeah. he liked play he liked more, and he was like, "It's got to be Mac, no question." Jeez, uh, that would be a lot more fun. All right, yeah, I'll, I'll stop pretending. Fundamentally, I don't believe in distractions, which is why I've never used that word. But I hurt myself being making an argument for distractions, and I hated it. But I do think that you have to take into account the like emotional impact of some of the decisions that you make when you're in the leadership role. And that's what general manager and coaches are. And maybe I'm overestimating how the potential, because I think 10% is a high percentage chance for any of these locations that bringing in a person, like we saw this with any like great quarterback that's past his prime Mm -hmm. and hasn't accepted it yet. It's so rare that they become journeyman backups because teams are cautious of what happens when you bring them in it's also something that uh bomani and i talk about a bunch with black quarterbacks is like you got to get a black backup because the pressure is high when you got a white guy back there that all the fans want to come in and it becomes a thing I, so i don't know if you know this about brock he's not he's the whitest of white quarterbacks i'm pretty, out there. I'm pretty sure well i don't know That'd be a good <laughs> different show the, different yeah, show so entirely different show but <laughs> i think that there is something to the idea that you are sending a message to your team with that specific position you're sending a message to your team and to that player and that can be counterproductive that's all this is like when the jags signed nick Foles, ironically the jags and they came out that they they're like oh yeah we paid him $22 million a year, even though there was no one else bidding for him because he had to have respect in the locker room. If he wasn't getting paid that much, nobody would have respected it's, Nick Foles in the locker room. A lot of comparisons between Brock Purdy and Nick Foles. <laughs> yes, and that's why we avoided the joke. Let me ask you this. <laughs> Let me ask you this. Let's say Brock Purdy won the Super Bowl and it was the same situation otherwise. Would you feel more comfortable bringing Mac Jones in because Brock's job would be more secure yeah. having won a Super Bowl? Yes. Okay, I I don't disagree with that. I can okay. see the logic. Okay, can I have one more but, layer to this, Elsa? Yeah, which is like okay, there's a ton that's been bantered about with Fields going to the Falcons, who has been a really inconsistent NFL quarterback, and they're probably going to have to. I mean, I don't know what the asking price is going to be. Going to be Graziano has said that the market's less robust for Fields than the Bears imagined, but you have to imagine second round pick ish range. If you're the Falcons, would you have rather given up a sixth round pick for Mac Jones on the one year rental than? Justin Fields and giving up significantly more draft capital. I don't know, man. Mac Jones was real bad the last couple of years. I'd say no, because Mac Jones like has that. been bad, and I think Mac Jones' ceiling is lower than Justin Fields. And Justin Fields has been bad, but I think his ceiling is higher. I don't want either of them, honestly. The thing about Mac Jones, and and I think why I disagree with you about this is, with certain backup quarterbacks, the last thing you saw from them was good. Like, I think there's, like, if, if someone signed Jacoby Brissett, I could see, you know, be like, hey, Jacoby Brissett was awesome last year in Washington. Like, you know, it's Sam Darnold, maybe. It's like, okay, well, Sam Darnold almost led the Panthers to the playoffs in 22. Like, you know, I could see people getting excited about him. Mac Jones was the worst quarterback in the league last year. And he was the second worst quarterback in the league the year before behind Baker Mayfield. The third, third, third worst behind uh, Zach Wilson and Baker Mayfield. Like, he's been terrible. If you're a Niners fan... You don't want to see Mac Jones in the field. And if you're a Jaguars fan, and I, I think that's what with the Jaguars side of things, like the reaction to this trade has not been good. Like there is real frustration from Jaguars fans that I've seen with regards to the idea that like if they're going to prioritize trading for anything right now, trading for a broken quarterback who really has one year left on his deal, not 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 winning a lot of uh, awards in Jacksonville. I think the Justin Fields question you you managed not to answer. But I think I would take Justin Fields over Mac Jones. And I've been like opposed to Justin Fields when m- many of these other comparisons were being made. I've taken the other quarterback. But to your point, Mac Jones and Justin Fields have both struggled the last two seasons. But they both can can plausibly blame a lot of things around them. <laughs> right? Yes. But, 
But that's fair. In that time, we saw Justin Fields do some incredible things, and it's not just with his legs. We've seen him in that. Um, I think it was the Lions game, and I guess it's just like the things that stick out in your memory. It's like that Lions game. I was like, oh, he was awesome, and we've seen him be great in college in a way that Mac Jones was not. I mean, he was good in college, but we weren't sure that he had this level. Or he, we know that he never had the level that Justin Fields had. So I'm, I've been one of the few people who are not so excited about. He was a better college quarterback than Fields was his last year. Yeah, but we all talked about how it was not him; it was everything around him. And then we <laughs> saw him get to the league, and that's not. It's just not the same. Yeah. I'm, I'm talking about perception now, yeah. which is mm-hmm. I think goes a lot into the decisions that's being made. I don't see either of them going to Atlanta and make it work. But Bill, if you had to pick one, you're not going to pick either. I'm picking Justin Fields. Okay, good. We're on the same like, page. Like, 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 he's he's a guy who can get a bucket on his own. Like, Mac Jones, you you need to clear out the lane. You need he needs to get like the layup drill going. Like, you need to. There can't be anybody blocking his path at this point. His confidence is so shot. His his whatever he had his first year when he was a solid quarterback. I think that they protected him. They didn't have him throwing the ball, dropping back third and long a bunch. But like, they did a good job of protecting him, and he looked confident, played confident one game for that team like i think that's not a one-year project that's not a we're gonna fix you over the summer and you're gonna be fine in september i think he has years before he can get back to being the guy he is justin fields like i think the arguments you can make are stronger in terms of the offense not being structured around him i think you could make the case that he is better in terms of creating out of structure whereas mac jones i think is creating entirely in structure I, I think those are all arguments for Justin Fields. Would much rather pay even a two for Justin Fields as opposed to a six for Mac Jones. All right. Appreciate you, Bill. This has been fun. Do this again next time we have some fun football news. Thanks, buddy. All right. Next up, David Dennis Jr. Welcome, David Dennis Jr. is here <laughs> alive because of the grace of uh, the Boston import export business. Welcome to the show, buddy. It's been a while since we had you on. Yeah, it's been a while. Happy to be here. Happy to happy to hang out with you guys. Um, you know, I um, you know, I miss the days being made fun of for my gym selfies. But uh, uh, now you call for it. See, you know, now we got to put it up. But Charlie's been posting golf selfies, which I contend are more douchey than gym selfies. No, I would say. No, no, no. I would First say. of all, Charlie, I would Charlie, say. see, this is the problem with me rarely being on social media, is I don't know about this. I would be roasting Charlie if I knew he was posting golf selfies. Oh, yeah. He's 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 on, I'm like, check out my swing. Look at the improvement on Ooh, the swing. Brian, Brian, uh, make sure you cut this in. Cut all this in. I need to, people need to like, see that the snack is out there trying to, trying to golf trap. Trying to golf trap with the, with the, with the, from, from behind the camera, Ooh. you know, catching the, the ball all going he's got a nice little twist of the hips Stop looking, it looking here's spelt. the thing is if if i could if i could post myself in a tank top sitting on a sled i would uh-huh. but i've got some doughy pasty bingo wings and no one wants to see these bingo wings jingle when i yell bingo you don't want to you don't want to ruin the ruin the appeal that that has already been you know formed about you on the internet i got That's you right. because no one would ever ever post a pasty bicep on the internet that would be so <laughs> unusual anyone could ever do anything like that that never happened before not anyone that's here i mean david's been i feel like i feel like there's going to be a picture of me with a tank top on the golf course <laughs> i feel like this this is what's going to happen but, there. And this, i feel like this backfired tremendously you weren't you weren't and, doughy uh, though that's the thing you weren't doughy. You're, exactly right. you're slim and yeah. no definition just <laughs> just, just a little stick of chalk. I'm going golfing with with Kevin Clark next week, oh, David. Man, oh, that's so uh, all right. No, it's gonna gosh. be a lot of names are gonna be dropped, and a lot of doughy uh-huh. golf swings are gonna be recorded. Oh, it doesn't get much oh, douchier than golfing yeah, with Kevin Clark. Be, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like you're gonna say the word froyo a lot, a lot while you're there. That just feels like something you're gonna say. What else? The yeah, I feel like there's lots, <laughs> lots of beers. Like, right? I had a party this weekend. We had a party for um, the parents of black students at my daughter's schools, and so it was probably uh-huh. like a hundred people at a house, um, all parents of black students. So there was like five white people, um, mm-hmm. and a couple other non-black people, but mostly black. And so we bought, like, we had a bartender. Alcohol was there, obviously, but we bought beer, and I was like. 
don't really need that much beer. <laughs> like, <laughs> right. I, 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 don't, I mean, I can I can stereotype because I'm with us. We don't really <laughs> with beer like that. Like that's not really our thing. Guess what? Ton of beer left over that I'm gonna have to give to my white neighbors because <laughs> anybody want them Heinekens? Anybody out here to try to drink yeah, Coronas? Yeah. Right, give us some wine maybe, but not beer. Go ahead and get some mixed drinks. I feel like black folks got the same gastrointestinal issues with beer that we have with milk, and we just won't we just won't acknowledge it. <laughs> we should just be honest with with how, what this thing does to our body, and just stick to the hard liquor. You beer know, is gross but. too. Like, I I drank a beer with Dominique yeah. once, and he was judging me for it supremely. But it, the problem was is that he had taken me on like an eight cocktail adventure, and I was just I was like this. I was like, you need to understand this. This okay. is strategic sobering up because I'll, I can't handle it. I'll, I'll I will let you in front of company lie. Eight, eight, eight cocktails. It was like two cocktails. Yeah, eventually. Charlie, you hit Charlie with <laughs> you hit Charlie with two tails, and he tipsy, man. Charlie was messed up um, after two cocktails. And the thing is, we're old enough now that there's no peer pressure, man. Just tell me, I don't, I don't want it anymore. But he was like, no, I gotta get a beer. Slow down, like just you asked me why. We were, we were, we were, like, we were getting dinner with Pablo and Wyatt Snack, and I ordered the beer. He's like, what? Do you, he's like, what the f- are you doing? And I was like, I don't want to get too drunk. I need, to, I need, I need a sober up beer. And now, now I know. That's what what I'm like. Just so, <laughs> you're gonna be you're gonna be twisted by the fourth <laughs> hole with Kevin oh, Clark yeah. trying to try you know, to <laughs> Kevin Clark keeps can I can I make fun of Kevin Clark? He keeps on texting me being going, we're going to Pinehurst. He keeps on going, Pinehurst is gonna be a movie, bro. My gosh. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah, this is yeah, there's gonna be the douche levels gonna oh. be through the roof. Just go ahead and pop the collar, preemptively pop pop your collar and like iron it so it stays <laughs> that's, I feel like that's what's he gonna jo- be. He's joking, right? Um, he's trying to be funny. I don't know. Oh, Gosh. I don't know. Oh, well, he please be joking, <laughs> Kevin Clark. Please. But then we, we'll put up a Twitter poll. Is Kevin Clark joking when he says <laughs> Pinehurst is gonna be a movie, bro? Oh, gosh, this is the um, most disgusting. Should we talk? Heard. Should we talk some basketball so I sound less like a douchebag? I'm talking <laughs> about how much up. I can drink and how bad I am at golf. <laughs> yes, um, let's do it. Okay, the NBA season is actually formally starting now. And it's been a uh-huh. really interesting week for the Boston Celtics because they've been, by net rating, a, a, an incredibly dominant team. But they lost to the Nuggets in a game where Jokic showed he was still sort of the alpha on the court. And they lost to a Cavs yeah. game that was pretty ugly. Um, the question that I have for you guys, which I don't know if there's a clear answer, but it's fun. That it's going to be fun to break down, is do you concern about the Celtics against good teams in high-level situations? So I was ready to brush off the Cavs mm-hmm. loss. Yeah. Like I, I was willing to brush yeah, it long off. Long season, I mean, things happen. Whatever. Long season, yeah. yeah. All right, all right, cool. It's weird. Dean Wade like <laughs> goes crazy. Their stats in the in the clutch, like clutch overall, is actually like still pretty good. They're like I think top ten um, in clutch performance f- overall. And I was fine. Like it was okay, right? But then when you look back at the game itself and like actually look how that those those plays just broke down. And against Denver, like it's just that they when when it gets tight, they just don't look good. And a lot of that is on Jason Tatum mm-hmm. and the fact that he is statistically literally the worst clutch player in the league with you know somebody who has as many attempts as he has. And it's those it's those mid range, those Kobe fadeaways. They lose every the Derek White pick and roll just disappears down the stretch, and that's the stuff that worries me because in the playoffs, like the playoffs look more like those clutch regular right. season minutes throughout the entire game. And that's the thing that, that sort of has a red so flag. Up my there. inclination was when I was hearing this, it felt like the tide was going in this like anti Tatum direction and anti Celtics direction. So like my inclination as Charlie knows, he's called me out, even though I've denied it, I'm a bit of a contrarian. My inclination was like, no, Jason being a Tatum contrarian about being a contrarian. <laughs> Jason Tatum is awesome and has been awesome since he entered this this league at a very young age Mm -hmm. and my like pushback in my mind was kind of like relax guys it's like it's Mm -hmm. not like he hasn't come through in big moments like he's done big things in the playoffs but he hasn't gotten over that final hump but it's really hard to contest with the eye test I mean the numbers that you point out clutch numbers it's hard to push back against that. But the eye test of how difficult it seems for him in end of game situations. And frankly, just about all his scoring opportunities are an exercise in offensive, like elite skill level, which is good that you have that, but I'm going to need you not to pull it out all the time. Like it feels like his offense is just him being crazy sound and technical, 
but not in a way that makes for easy shots. It's like it's mentioned it's those fadeaways, it's those long distance shots. He's a great three point or was a great three point shooter and shoots a lot of and it's a three point shooting team, it's a three point shooting league. So I get it, but I I'm starting to come off of my desire to be the contrarian because it's like a reverse contrarian because their <laughs> their all their end season numbers are so great that everyone's like they should right. win the title, but we all secretly are like, but no, they not <laughs> like they they yeah. not gonna win yeah. the title. So this is something I I, I do have a Tatum question because obviously. Look, anyone debating if Tatum is an awesome basketball player or not, that's sort of missing the point. It's it's like when you get to this top, top level, we're totally splitting hairs. Is he good enough to be great enough in these situations? But you talk about the insane skill that Tatum has. And when I watch him, obviously, the length is ridiculous. He's strong. He can be a really great jump shooter in streaks, even though his his shooting motion has is a bit more hitchy than someone like a Durant. So it goes up and down. Mm. But I feel like his lack of skill and decisiveness is actually glaring because he makes tough shots, but he's taking those tough shots in a way that other six nine wings who have good ball handling and good shooting skills don't have to. You think of someone like Durant or Kawhi Leonard who are great jump shooters and great jump shooters in tough situations. They're decisively getting to their spot, not reacting to the defense and hoisting up tough shots. And that to me is something that's like, uh, I mean, it's hard to say that's going to be the Achilles heel for the Celtics because they've been able to build such a great team around Tatum, but that's to me the Achilles heel of holding Tatum back from being like a great, even greater player. Yeah. There are just these players that like, when you get to, I mean, obviously, as you mentioned, Tatum is and at the elite level, top tier NBA talent, but there are some players that like, no matter what you not stopping them, right. right? You can't do anything about it. You can't do anything about Jokic when he's mm-hmm. on and be the same way. I would say Steph Durant, Kawhi probably at his, at his peak is, is like that too that there's you know double teams nothing works right but then there are players that like you can just you can turn their it seems like you you can figure out how to turn their water off right and Tatum he's still young I mean there were times early in LeBron's career where he could you could sort of like phase him out of game stuff you could double team and do things like that but Tatum is still at a level where it feels like you can turn the water off on him. And that's, that's a huge problem. (laughs) Yeah. So I guess that's a fair point to call me out on (laughs) using the word skilled, because I think that there are some basketball skills that are not as glaring or as Mm -hmm. obvious because what I'm actually saying is he makes a lot of tough shots. And to me, that Mm -hmm. seems like someone who's really skilled, but you're saying they're forcing him to take a lot of tough shots. And on the days when he makes them, he looks unstoppable. But the fact of the matter is there are players that when and this is the thing I think is the biggest question or the biggest like, uh, I guess, indictment on him is he started out his career so incredibly that it does not feel like he's added this. And I guess it's a mental skill of the game that other players add at some point to feel like they can control the game. And those are the names that you're talking about. People that can control the game. They don't win the title every year. They don't win every Mm -hmm. game, but they lose on their own terms because they have controlled right. the game. And I felt like the Celtics last year against the Heat was the most obvious example that earlier in their runs, even they made it to the finals, they made it deep in the playoffs, we were like, they're young. It's okay, mm-hmm. they're young. And then last year was the year where it was like, okay, you guys are too old to be having this problem <laughs> with this right. team that is not talented enough and is forcing you to do things that you don't like. And Jason Tatum is taking tough shots and Jalen Brown is getting his pockets picked and the team seemed like out of sorts. Can I say one thing about this? Because we've been pretty negative about the Celtics and Tatum. They're also one of the two teams in the NBA that can conceivably win the well, title this year. That's only and because <laughs> there's, there's, there's no teams in the East that can win the title. No, but it's also because this is like, like okay, if you go through – the way this team is built, and this is going to sound weird because we're in such a different NBA era, this is like a modern version of the 4 Pistons, where it's a strength and numbers team, where it's where it's five guys who can make the big shot or make a big play, right. and they can strangle you defensively. And like this is coming up with an 11-game winning streak where they were like plus yeah, we 243, sound we sound and nuts. they were annihilating people. We sound crazy. Yeah, they yeah they were, and it, and it's like a week ago when they beat the Warriors by a million points. It's like Sorry okay, this that. team is clear. Clearly, <laughs> this team is clearly going to beat everybody. But the problem is the Boston Celtics, I would say, since Tatum and Brown have been there, have lost more play. Like their eliminations have majority been against teams that they should have probably beaten. Hmm. Right. Like the, we look at the Heat. They were, up. you know, obviously they should have beaten the Heat team. They were up to one against the Warriors in game four. The Warrior team was falling apart. Yeah. Draymond was, you know, was was giving them nothing. They probably should have won 
that series, the bubble heat series, you know, they should have won that one also. Like even, I mean, I would even say the 18 against the Cavs, that LeBron team, they probably should have beaten. I mean, they were young, but still like, there's just so many, like we can look at them now and say they're better than everybody, but they're probably, they've lost a lot of series that they should, that they should have won. I'm personally offended that they lost that series to the Warriors because that was, that was when, when Steph goggled me. Mm -hmm, (laughs) Yeah. mm -hmm. I, I'm not ashamed of that. That's kind of cool. I thought. I remember. I remember Bomani was like, "I bet you learned a lesson. Did not give him, not give him something that they could use with like a photograph." And I was like, "I thought it was f- cool that Steph Curry was on the podium thinking about me and Kendrick Perkins after he won a championship." So, D- David, one thing you said was interesting about those playoff losses, and what I think is interesting about the Celtics team is we usually go into the playoffs saying the team with the better player is going to win the series, and I think in all of the mm-hmm. series they lost the other team, and it, and it particularly if you're gonna add credence to playoff Jimmy Butler has had the better player in all of those series and not just like in practice and on paper. Um, and that's what makes this, this is something we were talking about before the show, me and Dominique, when you compare them to the nuggets and you think about this team, like this Celtics team feels like the San Francisco 49ers. Like they, mm-hmm. they're stacked in all of these places, it's but a great they, analogy that, they got Brock that, we're not, that we're not stealing at all from it's producer like, Kevin. No, producer Kevin did not come up with uh, this whatsoever. A great analogy that um, we completely created ourselves. Sorry, I cut off your Brock Purdy joke. Well, yeah. it just it just makes it much more difficult um, to be. I mean, no one's calling him Bib, Big Bleep Jason, so that's the difference <laughs> between him and Brock Purdy. <laughs> Well, I mean, yeah, the parallel is it, but like that just means Jason Tatum's got to be the best player on the court, right? <laughs> like, I mean, that's just, that's just what we're talking well, not about. If that court, you know? Not if the, the court is going to involve uh, Nikola Jokic because he's the best guy in the NBA for another year, it would seem. Uh, he didn't get the MVP last year, which which Charlie is deeply offended by, but I mean, he didn't deserve it. Okay. And B was better. Whatever, Kendrick. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, are we? Are we, I mean, are we sure? Are we sure the Celtics team, if Embiid is healthy, we sure the Celtics team is gonna like. I mean, make easy work with, with the 76ers. Come spot? on, like, David. Celtic, David, the, don't don't make me boot you from this Riverside <laughs> Lake. The, 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 the Celtics will handle that business. Carry the hell on. <laughs> I, I mean, they, you look, trust Joel Embiid in the playoffs? I do. I, look, I I don't trust man. We, like guys, the Celtics that Heat team had nobody. Nobody. They just made fifty threes a game. Yeah. <laughs> they were like, yeah, I mean, they they had nobody, and they you know, and they blew them out in Game Seven by a million points. You know, like I, you know, there's like playoff Jimmy, whatever playoff Jimmy is. The Celtics can also be like the opposite of that <laughs> as an entire team, which is like the terrifying thing. Is there any hope for the Bucks? Like, no one we haven't even mentioned. I feel like we owe it to um, Giannis to at least bring them up in this conversation if we're gonna bring up. The 76ers with MB coming back from injuries, we have to respect the healthy Bucks team, right? I, the team I would respect above them is 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 the Heat again. I don't think they will do it, but Rozier is a pickup. Hawkes is awesome. Jimmy Butler and Bam are great players. Um, the thing with the Bucks is like Damian Lillard, both in practice and statistically, are is a much diminished version of himself than we thought he was going to be with this team. Don't tell that the Glorilla. <laughs> <laughs> Kirby on Kirby. Yeah. Um, I don't. She tweeted I don't, that yeah, she the, found him attractive. Essentially, mm, yeah. I don't know who that is. And he told team. Oh, you don't down. know. You, uh, yeah, Glow. It's it's a yeah. It's a bang. I'll play it for you. You don't know who Glow really is. Yeah. What? The man's going to Pinehurst. He's going to to America. He's going, to it's America. Gonna, it's gonna be a movie, bro. <laughs> He's going to Pinehurst <laughs> with Kevin Clark. Of course, they are not gonna be thumping Glorilla in the back of their uh their golf carts. You walking? That's, that's no, are you kidding? <laughs> look at look at me. <laughs> you just take a look at me. <laughs> All right, I'll, I'll play yeah glow for you in the break. Um, what else you want to talk about? You ready for con- some conspiracy theories? I love a good conspiracy. Yeah, this theory. is great. Thank I actually you. love this this story. So, um, Ethan Strauss wrote this article. It was bantered about a little bit by Tom Haberstroh about how in the middle of the season the NBA scoring cratered and. It's because they're calling free throws differently and scoring is down. My question, I think Adam Silver, cunning Adam Silver. Do you think he quietly addressed the crazy scoring the season by changing the game, way the game is refereed? Do you think he looked at Carl Anthony Town scoring 62 points and says, it was like, <laughs> or, to cu- or execute order 66. We need to change this. 
Uh, that's a Star Wars reference, Dominique. Oh, yeah. I did not know what that was. <laughs> I had no clue what that was. That was I assume, that was the, that, I assume that was the was, nerdiest thing I've ever heard in my entire life. Ever in Fine Nurse is going to get it. They're going to love it. <laughs> they're going to they're gonna appreciate it even more if you say Ortecute. <laughs> not <laughs> Ortecute. <laughs> Instead of Ortecute. That, I was caught I got, up on that. I got really I got, I got excited. My excuse. Ah! He was so excited to say they dropped the Star Wars reference. (laughs) Order to execution 33 or something. Um, Yeah. Order 66 is not the name of a game. It is not. (laughs) Although it should be. Um, The thing in this article that jumped out to me that I thought was kind of funny was they talked about how Joe Dumars was preemptively uh, <laughs> telling people like <laughs> on two hey, phones, yeah, <laughs> on two phones. Hey, but before the um scoring actually changed and the free throws went down, he was preemptively telling people that the league had nothing to do with anything. We didn't get involved right. in anything. So like, I don't know. I tend to be hesitant to jump on any conspiracy theories because they seem a little bit out there. But these numbers are hard to ignore. Like there's a uh, big swings in the amount of free throws that are. Uh, being taken but I think whether it's happening or not or whether it's premeditated or not the game is different and the games have been more fun which is important but the thing about this that grabbed my attention was it changes outcomes of games and Mm. if we are willing to entertain this as a legitimate possibility this year how many other times have they done this (laughs) and is it something that we should be considering when we're talking about what's happening in the playoffs and going forward because it does matter from as a football perspective like we normally every year there's like an area of emphasis which in my career we would have a meeting preseason area of emphasis the referees would come in and give us a training camp meeting and it's every damn year they're like hey well we're gonna tighten up on the defensive backs y'all can't do this that's all it was a new thing that we couldn't do to make it so that the quarterbacks could have bigger games and get everyone all excited but anyway what about this is interesting to you david what's what's interesting to me is the idea that any referee can help the atlanta hawks stop somebody from scoring 160 (laughs) points on them like there's like what like i don't understand uh like you would have to really be trying very hard to stop uh, uh, anybody, Doncic or whoever from scoring 73 against that Atlanta Hawks team. To me, the scoring was always about just the teams that just don't care to like play defense. Mm-hmm. Cause as like they're at, you, you play against Atlanta, you play against Indiana who, you know, is better defensively. Maybe that's the reason the score has been down. So people aren't scoring playing at um, Indiana and, um, and scoring 150 on them every, every, night but to me it's the fact that like when teams actually cared as they were scoring 150 points when teams were like when the Timberwolves were playing OKC or the Clippers were playing Boston or whatever those those games unless they're blowouts were not high scoring games like as that was happening you have a 107 103 game or something like that like when teams care and they play defense like they stop scoring like that and you're gonna see that in the playoffs scoring is gonna be down across the board in the playoffs I think that is more like stopping the scoring than the idea that you can stop, you know. That's a, a um, an interesting thing to me that, and I guess we've never heard people say this from any of the major league offices, but we always hear this thing propagated that more offense makes fans happier. And I've never mm-hmm. quite agree with that. And I always thought it was because of my defensive bias, but like we see like more home runs has not made baseball more interesting, more score. Like fundamentally what you want is high level ordercution from both teams and <laughs> both like in intense situations. Like I am fine with right. a low scoring game and we're coming off in, in the green room. We're watching uh, the SEC women's uh, uh, championship game. It's intense as hell. Like, I don't care how many yeah. shots you're making. Yeah. They in there fighting and pulling hair and, like, literally getting flagrant fouls for pulling hair. Like, playing hard is what I want. And then it brings us back to the issue with NBA basketball. When you play hard, that's what I want to watch. I don't really care about how many shots are being hit. That's the whole point. I think it's a, when the scoring was artificially inflated because right. so many rules had been changed to benefit the scorers. Um whether it's freedom of movement, three in the key, et cetera, et cetera. And the game was being officiated where you could jump back into players, you could draw fouls X, Y, and Z way. That's when it becomes less fun for the fans to watch. If it's like if it's high intensity and guys are making right. insane shots, no one's no one's complaining about that. But you know something is up, to your point about the Hawks. The Hawks won a game ninety nine ninety two this week. So <laughs> Adam Silver, you dog. I didn't think you had it in you. <laughs> well you appreciate it though. I love it. 
Yeah, that's got to be. Yeah, I mean, it's it's really just like if people are chucking up threes and they happen to go win, you score a bunch of. But like the games that pe- like the the general fan actually watches, those are intense, intensely defended games for the most mm-hmm. part, right? Like the things that are running up the score. Again, when the Hawks played the Pacers, like. Uh, earlier in the season, I think they played them like twice in a week and it was like 160 to something. Like it was a trip double overtime game or something like that. Like those are the games that are like elevating the score and you have a good team playing like the, the Charlotte Hornets or whatever. But when the games that are actually watching that are nationally televised that mean something right now, those are heavily contested, well-defended games. Nuggets um, Celtics mm-hmm. is a prime example of that where the Celtics are trying everything they could to stop Jokic and he was just like grabbing Chris Stapp for seeing us by the ankles and swinging him around the court and dunking all over the place and that was just beautiful basketball to watch. <laughs> they tried to double him they tried a bunch of different people on him it's just he seems inevitable which is why the Patrick Mahomes comp feels accurate. Can I can I say something we were debating before the show, David? Oh, here we go. I knew this was oh, coming okay. up. He's, all right. All right. Uh, get, get ready to have my argument poorly framed. Dominique doesn't right, think that go. he thinks that the Nuggets are fun to watch, but he doesn't think Jokic is fun to watch. Close. Oh, okay. Here we go. All right. Give me. Give me I why. said. Why is Jokic so no, unfun to I watch? said. Nick, see, I didn't say it was unfun. See, you heard. You go gang. Or you go go his side. <laughs> I said that, like, which is obvious. That <laughs> why do you think white players are less fun, Dominique? <laughs> <laughs> um. <sighs> Because it's just too common. We see it too often. It's boring. It's just like the scoring <laughs> has become too easy for Europeans to come over here and take this game from us. Oh, Gilbert. Um, so, no. The the point of the matter is I was saying that I – it's it's obvious about his explosiveness. I wasn't arguing against him being fun to watch. I'm saying that he makes the games fun to watch. But, like, the person who's actually dunking is Aaron Gordon. Like, he makes it fun to watch. And watching him be able to dissect the defense is fun to watch. But I was saying that the difference between watching Jokic play and watching maybe Steph Curry play is Steph Curry is like watching an action movie, which yeah. I love an action movie. Jokic is like watching a drama. That is smart. It is challenging. <laughs> but you know what don't go good on trailers? is pensive. Like that. No, nobody would watch a, pe- a trailer of a bunch of people thinking and talking about what they're going to do. You want to watch Steph Curry blow some <laughs> up. <laughs> like, that's the difference. Yeah, I, I, Jokic, is, uh, Jokic is like the prestige film that wins the Academy Award. Yeah. And you appreciate it more than you enjoy yeah. it. Maybe and that's what the to kid- enjoy a Jokic game, you got to watch a Jokic game. I could put mm-hmm. Steph Curry in the background and just be like, oh, what the so, <laughs> so for, for the what record, David, happened? I had uh, Curry, LeBron, and then Jokic as the three most fun players I, I can remember watching, particularly in person. Because Curry, I mean, like, I remember 2016, I was part of the people who went like two and a half hours early to watch him warm up. And I was like, this is the mm-hmm. craziest mm-hmm. I've ever seen. Young LeBron the, the same way. Um, well, you know. Glad we got that for the record, David. For the right record. Now. But for the record. There's, an amazing, there's an amazing Curry <laughs> thing that he touches the ball even more than Luka Doncic does, but he holds it mm. half as long. And so, like, right. the reason I think he's exciting is his pace of play, despite being super slow, is faster than, like, anyone in the league. And that is so, like, the pass he makes are ridiculous. I'm glad we agree. Yeah, I mean, but there was also there was also a curve of, like, training people to understand what he was doing mm-hmm. also. Right. Like, there was, like, I mean, there was the 40-foot shot and all that stuff, yeah. but now we are trained to watch him run around the, the court thing. and appreciate the him running around the court and the back screens and the way that he draws defense. Like, we're learning that. And I think it may take some time for people to really understand That's my point. But no, no, what no, no, Jokic no, no. is doing I, and, I agree and with you. that. I understand and appreciate it, but that's why my movie analogy is perfect. Is because while Steph is doing all these sophisticated things, he's also giving us action scenes. Jokic yeah. don't give us no action scenes. It's, Jokic requires us to watch, which is fine. You're so but I'm saying intellectual. Yes, I am. I am. I'm anti intellectual when it comes to basketball. No, I, I appreciate what Jokic does. I just want Charlie to accept that Jokic is not as fun to watch as Steph Curry. I'm sorry. Call <laughs> no, me crazy. I'm being I, I, will, I, will, I will call me crazy. <laughs> this is about Durant. Call he said he would prefer to watch call Durant take uncontested 18 footers. Now, now the thing, now the thing that I that I do enjoy about that that you can appreciate Jokic is the sheer panic in watching other oh, yeah. teams try to figure out how to stop again him and that's like my have point. no answer. Jokic for makes everything else around him more fun to watch, but Jokic don't give me no action <laughs> scenes, and I want an action scene every now and then. I, I want to see something blow up. That's all. I'm fine. We're, uh, we're filming this uh, just before the Oscars is airing, and I'm sure some pensive film is going to win some award that none of us want to watch. But you know what? Oppenheimer blew some 
up along with oh yeah that was uh, never mind <laughs> yes, yeah. Oppenheimer it was, did not, based, up. based on the true story makes it feel a lot grosser when it's like uh, some other movie where it's not based on a true story where it changed the course of history i haven't seen oppenheimer yet and i keep on um like queuing it up to watch it now because yeah. you watch it at home and I look at the runtime like, and I'm like I, I just yeah. I can't do it <laughs> just, I'll a, watch, just a I'll, year of, of almost watching but the thing is well there's I'll, no there's no point there's no point in watching now Dominique spoils oh, yeah. the movie he blows stuff up <laughs> but the thing is David I had no problem watching six hours consecutively of Love is Blind oh, and like it didn't didn't, <laughs> didn't phase me for a second <laughs> David is just like you he hasn't seen Oppenheimer either I, w- I watched Oppenheimer on an airplane, mm-hmm. which is, um, despite the IMAX of it, is really where it's supposed to be supposed to be watched on the airplane. In a very, I, I understand Christopher Nolan shot it on this beautiful IMAX, but watching it on a nice six by six screen, <sighs> Nolan. Um, while there's turbulence, Oof, is uh, is really the some... way to watch the movie. And you could take a nap. In and the Biscoff of the cookies plus Oppenheimer, electric. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, David. Well, I appreciate it. Yeah. <laughs> Do you have any Love Is Blind? It's over now, right? You are a Love Is Blind expert. We got, you got any? We got the reunion. We got the reunion coming oh, okay. up um cannot wait to see what happens with with clay and ad um you know jess and chelsea we're gonna you know i see you see you and uh you and the missus are, are having intense yeah. uh, love is blind conversations so, I, yeah. I mean love is Blind puts things on the table that i think are interesting to talk about love is blind itself um don't do it for me anymore because they fill the seasons with a bunch of nonsense. Like let's let's go to the pause, let's skip to the end. All the stuff in the middle seems like nonsense to me, but I do appreciate the stories that have popped out with um what do you call it? Megan Fox, fake Megan Fox is yeah. fun, and also AD and Clay. I've enjoyed that quite a bit, but uh, yeah, we'll see. I, I, maybe I'll watch the reunion. I'm interested in that. Reunion's always fun. And definitely watch yeah. the reunion recap show oh. hosted by David Dennis and Mina Kimes. Love is Kimes on the Mina Kimes YouTube channel. It's I'm not just saying this because I've gotten to help them with it. It is one of the best like podcast video pods that I've I've gotten to be a part of. They're awesome. I mean, every, oh, everything so that those two touch is great. Yeah, it's. It's as fun as the show, if not more fun. Oh, this show? That's so kind. That's a... <laughs> uh, no, no, Love is Blind. Oh, 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 oh. I thought you said it's, well, it's, really, as, well, really, you said it's good as this show. How dare you? I, well, I would say near. your show was more like entertaining in a Jokic <laughs> way, and ours is like in a Steph Curry kind of way. You know what I'm saying? That's, How I dare that's you? What it is. <laughs> but thank you. We are we are the greatest show uh, for a generation. All right. Thank you so much, David Dennis, for, for right, joining guys, you the, the Jokic of podcast. Thank you, Charlie. For being Charlie, um, Megan, Serafina, Kevin, Brian, Cortez. That's everybody, right? Oh, Podville, you're the best. This place is beautiful. See you later. Thanks, everybody. This is the Dominique Foxworth Show.